talking about working virtual machines. We're going to dive into the grid today. And uh, <laughs> virtual machines are probably the coolest thing ever. Woo! And I think they're going to change. If, if what I'm going to present today doesn't change the way you work, then virtual machines will change the way you work in the next five years. Definitely. Um, so I'm Mitchell Hashimoto. That's the avatar that I use everywhere. Uh, my handle is Mitchell H everywhere. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, GitHub. That's my homepage of GitHub. Um, I live in Seattle, Washington right now. That's the background image here. Uh, but I fly down here all the time. Uh, I will work for Citrus Vibe. It's already been done. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to L LA Review Grade. If you want cool ideas, you just want to hack with really smart review people like Evan Phoenix, uh, go to this thing every Tuesday. It's really fun. And at the same time, I want to give a shout out to Seattle.rb because I go to this every week as well. Um, well, not as well, depending if I'm in Seattle or LA. And uh, same deal. And at the same time, all my work and my presence here is sponsored by Engine Yard. And so they get a slam. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's take a look at uh, how do we work now. And I'm going to focus on web development. But you should know there's a lot of people using virtual machines for a lot of other problems as well, but the original problem I built Vega for was to solve web development issues I had. So that's the example I'm going to use. Uh, this should look familiar to most of you. It's a three-step process that you should all be familiar with. The first step is checking out your source code from somewhere. The second process is kind of a mystery. And the third is usually the server is up and running. And by this third step, I mean you could go online and interact completely with the website. Every part of the website should work. Uh, but I want to focus specifically on the second point here. Um, this is always kind of like black magic, like you, there's a few different ways this could work. Uh, the best case scenario is you have, a, you have a readme that looks like this, and this is, this is like, if, if, if I worked on a project and saw this, I'd be really happy, uh, because this almost never happens. But you usually check out your source code and you follow the steps and you try to install this on your local machine. More likely you check out the source code, you try to run it, you see what stack traces are thrown and slowly cobble it together. Uh, but that's what we're looking at, and thank you, Brian. G. Willikers. <laughs> G. Willikers. There's. <laughs> Most of you probably aren't thinking this right now because this is how this is how you work, and you're okay with that, and you think that's how it's supposed to be. But there's actually a lot of problems with this, and uh, I'm going to go through them real quick. The first problem is it's not repeatable, so the. On a very basic level, that just means if you have a laptop and a workstation, you got to do this manual stuff on both, which is a time issue, but really just kind of annoying. Uh, but the more important issue is you can't really go back in time. You set this all up on, uh, imagine you're working on a website and you have, uh, you're working on some major new feature, which is, has, has a lot of code change, maybe infrastructure change. Uh, and while you're working on it, your boss says, well, you got to fix some bugs on the main website because that's launched and what you're working on isn't. And so, your only option right now is to try to band-aid your infrastructure to work with your old website and hope that you could continue fixing things, or perhaps just throw everything you have away, work on another machine, or who knows. So that's an issue not possible right now. The other issue is it's not verifiable. Uh, so by this I mean you could get your infrastructure up and running, and you could run your unit integration tests, and they could all pass, and so everything seems okay. Uh, but since you're running a readme and it's a manual process, you can't actually verify everything set up correctly. So if you have slight configuration differences or version differences, uh, or maybe your system didn't change something, you won't actually know until down the road. And this problem will happen at some point, and it's going to be one of those problems that you're going to find on a Friday night, and it's going to take until Saturday afternoon to fix, and you're going to realize there's like one line. And you're going to be pissed. And then the third problem is it's not isolated. Okay. No. Yeah. Go ahead. Test. Test. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The third problem is it's not isolated. And uh, again, on a very surface level, very basic, you are running your web server on the same, and your whole infrastructure on the same machine uh, as you're running a Twitter client and your browser and all sorts of other crap we run that on our local machines. And Modern operating systems are good, like this probably won't get in your way, and it'll never be a problem. Um, but a bigger issue, or more real thing, is if you're working on a, on 
a mature website. It's probably more of like a service-oriented architecture. There's going to be multiple pieces that talk to each other one way or another, and you're going to try you're going to try to run this all on your own machine. And the example I, I give is uh, I talked to someone that works at White Pages, and they have a separate server that does this. I guess it's a standard thing in the White Pages, Yellow Pages industry, where it takes a human entered address and they just send it to the service, and it returns this queryable binary format that they could use internally. Uh, and if their developers actually just try to run this on their own machine, and it's meant to run a completely different infrastructure, so trying to run it alongside your web server and all that doesn't work too well, so you're not isolated. Gee will <laughs> yes. uh, So now virtual machines are the answer to all these problems and more. They're isolated, I don't think I need to explain this, they're just inherently isolated, we all know that. Uh, but more importantly, with the isolated nature, you can run multiple virtual machines and simulate that service-oriented architecture I was talking about. Uh, you get repeatability. Uh, I threw VA DevOps here because your company probably has a sysadmin and the sysadmin's like sole purpose is getting paid to efficiently and safely set up your servers. So he probably has scripts to set up your servers, so why aren't we using those scripts to set up our development? Because they're already done and they will match production exactly, so any bugs you have on development will exist on production. And you can also model complex relationships. And so this is kind of going back to the uh, service-oriented architecture. You can do a lot of things that you can't do on your local machine. You could simulate latency between virtual machines. You could, you could throw up a cluster of virtual machines and work them together and then just demolish one of them and see how your, your system inter uh, reacts. And it's really hard to do this on just in a single address space. And for the business people, or the managers, or directors of engineering out there, um, there's, these are a couple points that you could also use to convince your boss this is a really good idea. You get faster resource onboarding, and by that I mean if you hire someone, uh, they don't have to spend a day learning your infrastructure or anything, you just like throw them a virtual machine image and they should be able to get like a commit in by that day. Uh, and designers can do it too. Designers like this a lot because Usually the way it works is you sacrifice an engineer's time, and an engineer's time is really expensive, and we all know that. Um, and you sacrifice half their day or even the full day where they sit with the designer and they set up their, the, set up the whole thing on the designer's machine so the designer can sit there and just basically use a read-only website to test their, their designs. But with a virtual machine, they could, they could just run it all the time, and they could run any version of the website. And for more visual people, this is a slide I showed at the meetup, but I almost took out, but people liked it. This is uh, what your development looks like right now. And uh, the goal is to make it look like this. And possibly have multiple of these virtualized OSs up there that all communicate. Gee willikers, <laughs> this, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah. If you're not really excited right now, then you should get that checked out. It's not human. <laughs> so now, now so, so by now, I hope I convinced you that using virtual machines is a pretty good idea, and what you're doing right now is kind of crazy. What we are all are doing right now is kind of crazy, and I'm going to introduce Vagrant as a way to to solve this problem. And Vagrant's a tool that uh, myself and John Bender, I don't know where he is, but he's out there. Out there. Uh, we wrote about it over a year ago now, and we basically took the manual steps of setting up a virtual machine, and since then it's evolved into quite a beast. And so what is it? What is it? It's a tool for managing your development environments. It basically gives you, it allows you to describe your virtual machines in a version controllable way and also gives you a command line tool to spin up virtual machines, destroy virtual machines, etc. You can think of Vagrant kind of as the uh, local EC2 host. You're, you're just, you can just think of them as instances on your computer. And a really important point is this, it, it was built with the original goal and it still, to this day, it stays out of your way. Uh, because as web developers, over the years, we've developed processes that make us really efficient at what we do. I mean, we have, we have our special um, text editor, Emacs or Vim, or something crappier. Um, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have our web browser, Firebug, Web Inspector, whatever you have. I mean, when, when we see a stack trace, or we see something that's not working right, we know exactly what to do to start debugging that thing, and we usually fix it really fast. And so any tool that comes and, and 
threatens that should be taken, you know, sh shouldn't be used without a significant amount of evidence. So instead of doing that, Vagrant just doesn't change anything. You, you continue working the exact same way, and I'll show that in a demo. And how does it work? There's two parts to how it works. The first part is the Vagrant file, which is the um, same thing uh, in spirit as a make file, or a gem file, or a rake file, or a fab file, or an X file. And it just describes the virtual machine in a very concise way, so that Vagrant knows how to set up what you're doing. And then the second part, and this is meant to go in version control, so that you could go back at any point as well. And the second thing is a command line tool, and that's why it's in monospace font there. Um, and that gives you access to spin up machines, uh, provision them, SSH into them, and so on. So first, let's look at the vagrant file. And like I said, its purpose is to describe the VM, and it's really short. It's currently Ruby, it's all written in Ruby, and for the foreseeable future it will be Ruby, but it someday it won't be. Um, but you just described the VM really short, and here's an example of a Vagrant file, and this is kind of the bare minimum you need to get a VM up and running. You can think of this box thing as an AMI, if you speak EC2. Uh, it's basically just a base image so that every time you spin up a VM, it doesn't have to actually install an operating system because that would defeat the purpose of spinning up an instance took like 30 minutes. So this could get, this just clones a hard drive and builds a uh, virtual machine on top of that. And here's a slightly more complicated example that your VM is provisioned with Chef. So if your system in has, who knows what Chef is here? Everybody? Cool. Or Puppet, same spirit. Uh, if your if your system has Chef scripts, you could actually use them to provision your VM. And in this case, we're just using Chef Solo and telling it to use the Apache 2 recipe. And you see the same uh, box thing before. And if you're a Puppet user, it's that simple. It, it, I'm not trying to say that Puppet's simpler than Chef here, but Puppet has its own set of options, but you don't need them, whereas with Chef you do. And you can also use a shell script if you don't want to learn, if you, if you don't know Puppet or Chef and you still want to use this stuff, and maybe you do have a README, just pull it out kind of into a shell script and you can do it this way too. And then all these can be composed as well, so maybe you want to do a shell script to bootstrap your machine to prepare for something else, then you want to run Chef, you can do that, you just put them in the right order, it's imperative. Here's another cool thing you can do, you could uh, network the VM to a static IP, so this literally means when this VM comes up and I type 33.33.33.10 in my browser, I want it to actually go to the VM and not to whatever actually is that, that's actually the Department of Defense. And you probably won't ever have to go there. It's a safe IP to use. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a lot of people try to network it to 192.168.something or 10.0.something because they're like, oh, well, my router uses that for my own local network, so I'll use it too. But if you stomp on one of your previous computer's IPs, it really trips out your computer and it has no idea. I don't know enough about the networking stack in, in BSD or in Linux to know what's going on, but I just know that it doesn't go to the VM and it doesn't go to that other computer. It just goes to a black hole and nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> and I get these, I get bug reports like weekly about this. And for more, adva for more advanced websites, you can actually do multiple VMs in a single variant file. So if you're running a service-oriented architecture, you could do this sort of thing. Uh, and you could just think of them as functions where the config, it's just their scopes so that VM object is just a config object specific to the, the VM it's defining. And you could spin up all the VMs in the cluster, a few of the VMs, whatever you want. Uh, if you, I mean, if, you're, if your architecture is like 10 VMs, that, that doesn't really make sense to run on a machine. So you could spin up a few at a time. And if you use the networking that I showed, as long as they're in the same, what is it, a slash eight block, like at the end, it, it, that last number, as long as that's the only thing that changes between them, all those VMs can communicate to each other uh, using those IPs. So if you have a service-oriented architecture, that's how you test it. And then, I'm not gonna go through each of these, that's really boring, but this is the Vagrant uh, command line thing, and these are, just some, there's a few more uh, of the 
things that you can do with it. It kind of has a git style. You give it the bigger binary and then this task you exactly want it to do. And it does it, and you could do dash dash help to see all of them. There's really not, there's like two more than this, but I don't want to keep going. <laughs> and the OMG demo, demo. Uh, but first, this, all my examples, I just open sourced this like, over lunch. Uh, but the examples will be here. Don't try to run them on the internet if you're blessed enough to get internet here, because running any of them will attempt to pull down like megabytes of stuff like Apache and image magic and stuff like that and you just won't get it to work and you're gonna think it's Vagrant's fault and it's not my fault. <laughs> so do it at home, it's really cool. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like. <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. Vagrant's just like the Apple background. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I took from Apple. <laughs> This works. <laughs> I hear some smart ass comment from Evan Phoenix. So track will be up and running, and if you look at, let's see, 
So I'm using all these big open source projects as examples, but you can uh, but you can imagine that it's your actual website, which at some critical point, critical mass, becomes a huge pain in the butt to install too. And so the same exact thing, except that I mapped it to dot twelve so that it doesn't stop on the other one. All these VMs are running together. So I go to dot twelve. I have track. I've been running. Woo. Really exciting. <laughs> I, I didn't get the login working because it doesn't just work, apparently it just doesn't work out of the box. And I started looking at the documentation and it has all these cryptic like command line arguments you gotta pass. And it wouldn't be that hard, I would just have to modify a couple files to do it, but it 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 just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> and the last example is really simple. It's just actually a PHP, it's it's nothing more than a PHP hosting thing, a virtual host setup. Again, the exact same thing you've seen, but with dot fourteen. And each of these VMs is taking up five hundred twelve megs of RAM. Not, they don't usually take up the whole thing at once. But the myth that virtual machines are heavy is not true. And I, this this machine now has eight gigs of RAM because I routinely have around like six VMs running at once. But that's only a recent thing. I've had up to four VMs running completely fine, not noticing at all with four gigs of RAM. Woo, PHP info. And so the, the, the reason now that I did this really simple thing is I want to show you how your workflow would work with, uh, with Vagrant. And I don't want to dare edit track files because God knows what that will do. And I don't want to edit Rails specifically either because I don't know the internals of Refinery CMS. Uh, so yeah, we're going to edit some PHP now. Uh, it's a Ruby conference, please. Uh, and this, so I guess the important point is all this is running on my own computer. This Emacs is obviously, this is an S, I'm not SSH'd in anywhere. Uh, this is on my own computer. And the contents of this, this PHP directory is just the Vagrant file and index.php and then the, the Puppet folders that are needed for provisioning. And so I'm going to edit that index.php on my computer. And you're going to see the changes go live instantly. I can't move as fast as instantly, but trust me that it's instantly. Uh, I can't enter the VM. <coughs> this could have been a mistake. I haven't used PHP in four years. <laughs> and I'm just now realizing this, but we'll do, we'll do something. files that you have set up, ignore the dot These are the exact same files that are in your host machine. 
And the way this works is it uses VirtualBox shared folders, but if you use this in any real project, you'll actually use NFS, which Vagrant does on its own. It's completely automated. You just add a flag and it just does it. Uh, because VirtualBox shared folders don't work past like a thousand files. And I've opened a bug, and it's been closed as not a bug. And there's actually a bug open for about six years or something now, and they're just not going to fix it. So use NFS. It's a feature. It, the bug is a feature. If you pass a thousand files, what are you doing with virtual machines anyway? That's what they think, I guess. Uh, so yeah, so that works. And then, uh, let me shoot, oh, exit. You, go. Uh, you could, let me show you all the commands. So you can see all the commands here. Um, I have, I want to mention that if you want to get started with Vagrant, the uh, initial download for like the base image is like 500 megabytes. And if you want to avoid doing it, I have a flash drive with me here that you can just copy on your computer and use later. So if you're interested in just playing around this with Mayo and playing around with this maybe when you get home, just let me know and we can just copy it under your computer. And the other cool thing is this about six down, there's this vagrant package. If provisioning is starting to take like hours, it, it can take hours on, on a really large website, then you can provision your thing and then package it into a new base image and you could use that from then on and then it won't have to provision anything. And I'm actually working for the next version of Vagrant. We're going to completely change kind of the way this is working. Be better. Yeah, so it's an open source project. It's at vagrantup.com. It has, I've, I've been told it has very good documentation, uh, but there's a lot that isn't documented at the same time. But it's enough such that you'll be totally fine getting started. I might start selling a PDF though. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded like a good idea. Screencast, shame. No oh, shame. But yeah. Uh, Vagrant.com. It's open source. You can take a look at how it works. It's written in Ruby. That's why I'm speaking about it at a Ruby conference, but it's pertinent to everybody. So tell your friends. And uh, I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Brian. I have one question, one statement. Um, Go. What do you mean to the Ethernet? I, I don't. What do you mean by aliases? I want to write more than one cell site inside of my Vagrant box. So I need another IP. Oh, okay. Okay, no. It's not possible yet. But uh, the only reason it's not. The only, there's ways to make it work, and there's a bunch of people actually working on it right now. Uh, but no one's got a good solution yet. But for now, I would just say spin up multiple virtual machines if you can, and that could be your temporary solution. More questions? I got one more thing. Okay. Um, and the second thing, I've seen, your, I've seen your screencast way about three weeks. I got some lot better than that. My what this? Your screencast. And they're, they're oh, okay. So, yeah, I have a bigger screen, screencast. I made it in March of 2010 when I released the Vagrant 0.1, and a lot of the stuff still works uh, because I've been lucky enough to be pretty good about backwards compatibility. But a lot of it also doesn't work, and it doesn't highlight some of the strengths that I found over the year of development. So I need to redo that someday. Someday. Uh, can you uh, can you do configuration for load balancing on multiple VMs? Yeah, uh, using Chef or something, you could easily do load balance. You could easily you could if you're familiar with Chef, they use the JSON DNA that you pass through to the Chef Solo, and you can easily just hard code the IP addresses, or if you use the Chef Server, Chef Server support is built in, and especially with their upcoming environment support coming out, um, you can easily hook it into where it searches the server for all the web nodes, grabs the IPs, and magically configures the load balancers, yeah. Yep. Do you use the same puppet recipes for, um, for production that you use for Vagrant? Yes, completely. So even to the point where I showed you where they mount to slash Vagrant. I changed the mount point that the shared folders use to what they actually are in production, which is usually at slash serve SRV slash then the site name. And so I changed it to that, and I'm able to use the exact same recipes completely as production. 
Um, I'm trying to think of any differences. The only difference, uh, the only difference, I guess, is with Chef. Um, I know you mentioned you mentioned Puppet. And I use Puppet in examples, but I use Chef in production. And Chef um, server, I have two Chef servers: one for development and one for production. So Chef, the development one is where I put all the staged recipes that aren't ready for production, but I use that for development, and then they eventually end up in production. So I am sharing recipes. Yep. I noticed that you you're using uh, Lucid using Lucid 32. Are yeah. there any other boxes available or? Um, I only officially myself make Lucid 32 and Lucid 64, but the community has made Karmic boxes, Debian Lenny boxes, uh, CentOS, uh, Maverick, a bunch. Uh, but I guess if you're interested in this, jump on the mailing list and expect a long like roadmap email about what I'm working on. And then you'll see how this is all going to be a lot better in a few months. A lot more. You can look everything up. Any other questions? I saw one back there. Yeah, uh, this kind of reminds me uh, of the pool party that RV. I don't know if you uh, Yeah, I work with the RV, so. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any plans to like scale up the number of uh, virtual machines or scale them down based on different parameters? OK, so the question, I probably should have been re repeating the questions. but. Uh, do I have any plans of Vagrant to automatically scale up and scale down virtual machines? And I'm just going to answer no, because I don't think that's the problem that Vagrant's trying to solve. But you could easily... Um, Vagrant's scriptable. There's documentation on the website to using Vagrant as a library. And I, I would say that you could easily write like a pool party provider or whatever RE uses um, to control Vagrant VMs as well. And I, I guess on that note, I am also working, one of the things I'm working on is uh, supporting multiple, more hypervisors. This is on VirtualBox. That's an important point. I didn't mention it. This is all VirtualBox. And VirtualBox is awesome, but I'm also working on supporting like KVM and other stuff. But that, don't hold your breath. It's really complicated. And I've decided to hold off until after like a 1.0 release to actually get that in. So I would say six months to a year. Any other questions? Do you want them to communicate, or are you just saying just for development and production distinctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, the question is, can you can you set up VirtualBox uh, for local development, but then use EC2 for production and completely? I mean, Vagrant doesn't do anything specifically to help you with that, except maybe uh, push upon you good DevOps practices. Uh, but by creating <coughs> portable chef recipes and by sharing them between development and production, you really just have to have like a bootstrap script. To, to launch an EC2 instance and run the same recipes, and it should set up exactly as the developer. Any other questions? Uh, Shane. Is Vagrant battle tested? Is Vagrant battle tested? Vagrant's used by a lot of companies. I don't know an exact number, but um, on each release, there's usually around 1,000 downloads nowadays. But I know that a lot of companies, John Bender's Originate Labs, uses it full-time. Citrus Byte, the company I work for, uses it full-time, but we're small consultancies. There's also pretty big uh, big shops. Like There's one that all the developers, for some reason, run Windows machines, and Vagrant works on Windows, So and they develop Rails. I don't know how, <laughs> none of the, this formula doesn't work, but they, <laughs> they use Vagrant for all the developers in order to develop in a Linux environment on from Windows. God help them. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's pretty well tested to the point where I have to release betas now to make sure that corporate customers don't get customers, users don't get pissed off at me for breaking something. It's safe to use. Any other questions?